mentioned, there's essentially three different parts to electricity that we're going to look at. We're going to look at electrostatic, electronic circuits, and then magnetics. Um, if you are, one of the things about magnetism, I'm going to mention to you right now, um, it, it's not really clear the connection between electricity and magnetism. Hopefully it will be when we get to that point. But if you do anything, you know, if you have a device that works, you're like, hmm, I wonder how that works. The answer is magnets, pretty much. Um, <clears throat> so here we're going to talk about electrostatics. And so what is static electricity? Well, it's stationary charges, but they're not stationary 100% of the time. They're just stationary most of the time. Okay, so that's what electrostatics mean. Electro means charges, and statics means stationary. And so here you can see this little Dilbert cartoon. Um, where you shuffle your feet across the floor and you can build up a charge. Right? So here this says recall that everything's made out of atoms. You guys know this, right? And atoms have three primary parts. What are the three parts of an atom? Protons, neutrons, and electrons. What type of charge do electrons have? Now, what type of charge do uh, protons have? What type of charge do neutrons have? Neutrons, right? No net charge. So, this is the basis of our understanding. And you guys actually have a super advantage because when they really started studying electricity, you know, they started with electrostatics, but even when they started studying that, that was back in the 1700s, did they know what an electron was? No. We didn't discover electrons or protons or any of that until the 1900s. Okay? So you guys have a super advantage because you already know what these things are. So <clears throat> we have all of these charges inside of our atoms. And so to make electricity, or specifically static electricity, all we have to do is take the charges that are already there and we simply move them around. Now if we separate the, let's say, the negative charge from the positive charge, now we build up what we call a static charge. So we can do this um, to pretty much any object, because everything is made out of these charges. And so we say if an object gains electrons, it becomes negatively charged. And if it loses electrons, we say it becomes positively charged. Because in solid objects, those protons are what's making up the solid piece of the object. So the protons pretty much don't move um, if it's a solid. So the electrons are the things moving back and forth. So again, if it gains you know, more negative, well, it becomes negative. And if it loses the negative, well, it becomes positive. Everybody okay with that? And so here, this talks about the behavior of charge. You guys should pretty much know this, that opposites attract and like repel. If not, then I read that down. So with charges, if you have opposites, you know, positive and negative, they'll attract each other. And if they're the same charge, then they will repel or push away from each other. So, <clears throat> what's interesting is that this, uh, this slide is pretty good, and most of y'all should know that, but it misses out on one key behavior. Um, a charged object will also be attracted to a neutral object. Right? So just kind of keep that in mind, that if you have something that's charged, it will be attracted to something that doesn't have it. We'll kind of explain that today when we talk about the process of induction. So here I have a little demo for you of a butterfly. And this uh, let's call it a wand. So I put the butterfly here and I charge the wand. So it up with the same charge. So do the same two light charges, do they repel or attract? They repel. Notice that that was attracted to your computer. Huh? There you go. So it's attracted to neutral objects. So y'all can pass that little wand around. And <coughs> you can 
see that this thing, they both have the same charge, which is why they're repelling each other. Does that make sense? So <clears throat> that's what that thing is supposed to demonstrate is that, you know, like charges repel. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you all pass it around, you can wash your hands. Um, so do you all have any questions about opposites attracting your like repelling? Well, that is similar to this disc here. I used to have one of those balls, but we seem to have had one taken or displaced or something. I don't know where it is. But it's very similar to this disc here. So if I turn this disc on, it looks similar. So this thing looks similar. Um, this is basically the same thing, but this is not quite electrostatics. And the reason why I have it out or had that plasma ball out was because it kind of simulates an electric field. Because electric fields are hard to see. Uh, you can't see them at all. But what this thing does is it kind of shows an electric field here. So you can imagine like I have one charge here in the middle and I have uh, like uh, sorry, I have one charge here in the middle, and so everything else just kind of branches out from that. Um, what's actually going on here, or similar to the plasma ball, is the thing at the center of this, the thing here at the center, right here, is <clears throat> what we call a Tesla coil. And I'm not going to get into the details of Tesla coil, but Essentially what a Tesla coil is, is it's a very, uh, it's a coil of wire that has a very large current running through it. And it alternates back and forth very quickly. And because of that, it puts off a very large um, electric field. Now the thing is, is this electric field starts here in the center and it goes, well, obviously to the edge of this disc, but it goes actually further than the disc. It goes like out to space here. Do you see anything out here in space? No, but I assure you it's there, and I can prove that it's there in a second. But what's happening here is if I touch this, you'll see that I change the pattern. You all see that? And so here, I'm just going to hold it on the back side. What's happening here is these, they're not charges. Let me start with that. This is not charged at all. Like, am I getting shocked when I touch this? No. But <clears throat> what it's trying to do is this field that's occurring here, is trying to um, go from the very high voltage of the Tesla coil to ground. Like it's trying to find zero. Alright, so it's trying to go to zero, but with nothing touching it, it's just kind of going to the edge of this disc. You'll see that? Which is why it's lit up. And <coughs> here, if I turn off the lights. Hopefully you can see that. Everybody can see that. Alright. And so, when you touch it, you'll notice that it prefers my hand over everything else. Because I have charges flowing through me, and so I'm able to ground it a little bit better. That's the process that follows, right? Yeah. Okay. It's the same thing. Because it's, essentially what this is doing here is it's grounding out all the air, and air doesn't conduct charge very well at all. So here, this is just preferring me over the air. Um, so, <coughs> so we have opposites attract and likes repel. And there's three basic ways to transfer charge. So the first one is to transfer charge by friction. It's where two objects rub against each other. The second way is by conduction or direct contact, it's technically called conduction. And then the third way is called induction. <laughs> so I'm going to go through these three ways real quick. Um, the first way is friction. So it's like clothes in a dryer. Um, everything is made out of atoms, right? And these atoms are different. And we have this whole periodic table up here. I've seen this periodic table before. Now the periodic table works 
because it's based off the period. Do you know what the period is of the periodic table? Well, it goes from left to right, but why does it start over? Like, think about this. Like, your class period is a certain amount of time. And at the end of the class period, you go to another class period for a certain amount of time. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then that will repeat between the days, right? Why, looking at the periodic table, it starts, you know, with number one, and then the first row ends with number two. The second one starts with three, but it doesn't end with four, it ends with ten. Did you see that? So why are these rows, those are the periods of the periodic table, why are they shaped like that? Yeah. It's based on the electron shells. How many electrons does it take to fill up the first shell? Three. Two. How many elements are on the first row? Three. How many electrons does it take to fill up the second shell? Eight. How many elements are on the second row? Eight. How many electrons does it take to fill up the third shell? Eight. How many, how many things are on the third row? Eight. So do you all see the pattern? Like that is the period of the paracatalyst. It's filling up the electron shell. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so if it's neutral, it should have the same number of electrons as well. Now, here's the deal. One of the things you should also know from uh, chemistry is that the stuff on this side, the left side of the periodic table, likes to give up electrons, and the stuff on the right side of the periodic table likes to receive or take electrons, right? Except for those noble gases, right? So it turns out the stuff down there around number 87, 88, they like to give up electrons like nobody's business. And the stuff up there near oxygen and uh, fluorine like to steal electrons from everybody, right? This property is called electronegativity. And so things that are closer to oxygen like to steal electrons, things that are farther, you know, diagonally, um, like to give up electrons. So you can imagine that in your dryer, you've got clothes. Are all of your clothes made out of the same material? Your sheets made of the same material? Your blankets or as your socks? Probably not. And as a result, when you have all of those things tumbling around in the dryer, some elements prefer to steal electrons and some prefer to give them up. And when that happens is let's say that the socks stole electrons from your sheet. Well, if they did that, now your socks are negative and your sheet's positive. And what do opposites do? They trap. You ever had socks stuck to your sheet? That's why they're stuck. How do you prevent your socks from being stuck to your sheet? What do you do? You ever done laundry before? There's a thing you can put in the dryer to keep that from happening. Yeah, right. Essentially, the way dryer sheets work is uh, when you get them hot, they have like oil on them, and that oil comes off onto all of your clothes. And that oil will prevent the electrons from transfer. I say oil, that's kind of a crude way of saying it, but that's, a, that's essentially what it is. You don't know what oil is. Right? But doesn't it make the dry sheet like stick to the electrons that the material can Well, be, it'll end up sticking because of the oil when it dries. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because at first it'll just heat up, but then like as soon as it starts to cool off, then yeah, it'll stick to it. Because that's why the oil stuck to the sheet in the first place. So yeah, then you just have the sheet, and I'm just like, well, if that's the only thing it's preventing, I'm, I, I just don't use dry sheets. I'm also cheap, so you know, take that. <laughs> um, so friction is charging by contact, so things physically rubbing against each other. And I say rubbing because that's usually what people say, but really it has more to do with the fact that they're just different materials, right? And simply them being in contact, they'll transfer a lot of contact. Obviously, if you rub them, you'll have more surface area in contact, which is why I say rubbing. So here this talks about uh, John for voltage. We'll do that uh, demo here in a second. But let's go ahead and talk about contact for John for voltage. So contact, or uh, I like to say you know, charging by conduction, involves having an object that's already charged, and you touch it to another object. And when those two objects touch, charge will transfer. Generally, um, the charges will transfer until they're at the same voltage. And so what I mean by that is, Let's say that, let's take a very simple voltage, let's say it's zero, let's say it's the earth. If you touch something to the earth, it will end up with the same voltage as the earth, which you perceive as zero volts. Um, so for instance, if you shuffle your feet, say you put some socks on your feet, shuffle them across the carpet, you build a charge, 
and then you go touch the doorknob, you discharge in the doorknob. And you'll typically discharge everything because we consider the doorknob to be grounded. We'll talk about grounded here in a second. Well, let's look at John Travolta. So, so this is a little simulation here. Essentially, we're talking about 
about something contacting the earth. So think, think about those um, outlets, those electrical outlets you have at your house. Um, they have two kind of like square holes and one round hole, right? That's a poor drawing. But you guys have seen an electrical outlet, right? You got the circle with the round hole and the square holes. The two square holes, or rectangles if you will, are where you actually get power. Okay. Um, the round hole is ground. So you guys have noticed when we plug stuff in, some of it, some of those things have two prongs, some have three. And so you might ask yourself, well, why does this one have three and that one has two? There are laws stating, you know, whether or not this thing needs three prongs or two. But in general, most manufacturers, most electronic manufacturers, um, are aware of why you need a three prong plug and if they feel like, eh, maybe we need one, they'll just go ahead and throw the third prong in there. But what it does is it grounds your object. Okay, when I say ground, I mean literally the ground. Like the earth itself. Um, because what happens is all of these, the, the two rectangle holes are connected to your power lines that are running into your house, you know, however they're coming in. But this guy here, you know, along with his other terminals, these grounding wires are all wired together, and they'll be wired together in your house, and then they'll be con uh, connected to a metal pole that's buried in the ground. And some of you may have even seen this pole. Um, a lot of these uh, grounding rods are near uh, the meters in your home. So if you have like a, a gas meter, or like a gas comes into your house, or you have like an electrical meter where the electricity comes into your house, you often see like one wire just kind of like come out of nowhere, Maybe it just comes straight out of the wall, and then there's a, like a metal rod that's just attached to it. Like that is the ground for your house. It's not electrified in any manner at all. Like you can touch it, you can get rain on it, it doesn't matter. It is the ground. Because the whole point is that some of your electronic devices use a little bit of electricity, and they don't need the third prong. But basically, if they use enough electricity, there's a possibility of it killing you if it goes wrong. So what you do is on something, say, like your computer, you know, the actual computer that's plugged into the wall, um, those things have significant charges running through them, so they'll connect the whole box of the outside case to the ground. So literally there's a wire, you can imagine there's a wire inside of your box that's touching the side of your box, but it's plugged into the wire that goes into this ground. Because the whole point is, is if you have this big electronic circuit and something goes wrong, like a wire melts or something, and now you got electricity discharging here or over there. Um, it can cause many different hazards, and the easiest hazard for it to cause is well, just electrocution or death. So what they do is they take um, everything they connect it to ground, so that way if it shorts out, the, all the extra charge will just be dumped into the earth instead of into you. Does that make sense? And so, essentially, things have a third prong if they're going to have too much charge flowing through. So when I say something is grounded, I mean literally connected to the ground. So there's many different ways to connect to the ground. You can connect literally through this third prong outlet. Or if you have, like, say, metal pipes for your plumbing, well, the metal pipes already run through the ground, and metal's a good conductor, so you can just ground off of that. Um, so there's different ways to do it, and so like here in this uh, induction thing here, it's showing you that, okay, if I take this charged rod and I bring it near this neutral sphere, they're attracted. So in order to get it to induce a charge in the sphere, what I have to do is I have to take this sphere and I have to connect it to ground, right? Not the rod, but the neutral sphere. And so what will happen if you connect something to ground? If it's neutral in this case, remember these electrons are repelled from the rods, they're going as far away as they can get. But if you connect them to the ground, well then they'll, do, they'll go to the ground. And if I was to leave this ground connected and take the rod away, well then all the electrons would come back and it would be neutral again. But if I bring this rod near it, connect it to ground, take the rod away first, then disconnect, or sorry, take, disconnect the ground here first, then take the rod away. What ends up happening is that the electrons run away into ground while the rod's there, 
They take away ground, so then when you take away the rods, the electrons can't come back. So now your object is charged. You all see that? And so when you charge by induction, just like when you charge by friction, you don't charge one object by friction. When you rub two objects together, one comes up positive, one comes up negative. So when you charge by contact, you already have a charged object, and the second object comes up the same as your first. Does that make sense? But when you induce a charge, they come out opposite of each other. So you have a, an object that's already charged, so in this case it's negative, so we can induce a positive charge object on our other side. Or, if we start with a positive charge, then we can induce a negative charge. What's really nice about this method, you know, charging by induction, is that I don't use the charge that's in the rod. Like if I touch it by contact, I have to use some of that charge. Like it physically goes from point A to point B. But if I charge by induction, I don't use this charge. And so the great thing is I can do this over and over and over again. And I won't consume my original charge. Okay. Do you have any questions about that? Okay. So here, this is talking about that polarization that we mentioned earlier. And it, again, polarization is where you have an uncharged or neutral object that polarizes because you end up with a charge on one side of it. So here, you can see that like I have a positively charged rod and it attracts the negative, but this sphere is still neutral, right? It's just polarized. Now this is what happens in a conductor. Over here, this is more like what happens in an insulator. The, the balloon has a negative charge. Do you all see that? When I bring it near the wall, the wall is actually an insulator. So it's not going to pick up or receive any charge, but it's going to polarize. But here, the electrons are physically moving from like the left side of the sphere, or sorry, from the right side of the sphere to the left side. Let's do that. And up here, what's happening is these electrons are becoming polarized. They're still staying around their atom, but they're just kind of like leaning. So like in this case, like these electrons are just going a little bit deeper into the wall, leaving a positive surface charge. So it will still be um, polarized. And what's interesting here is that you can actually take a balloon and when you, you charge it up, you can actually stick it to the wall. But it's not transferring the charge. Because if it transferred the charge, then they would both be the same and they would repel. Right? But when you remove the balloon from the board, the board still is, has what we call a neutral charge. So I'll try to demo that uh, for you all in just a second. Well, actually, let's just go ahead and try to do that. So, I have a balloon here. And I said I'm going to try to demo it for you. Um, today it's not been working very well. Um, my guess is we have a lot of uh, water vapor in the air. So I have to charge this up somehow. So I'm just going to use this Van de Graaff here to charge it up. And I'll explain what the Van de Graaff is here in a second. Charge, okay, and you touch it to the electroscope, and the leaves spread apart. Y'all see that? 
and they spread them apart because they have the same charge. Does that make sense? So the electroscope is a historical thing that we don't really use anymore. But this has a charge and that has the same charge. As I bring this near it, you can see the leaves will spread out. Do you see that? You see how they're getting further apart? Can you see that? And so that indicates that they have the same charge. Because this is charged, and this thing will have the same charge. So the charges in here will actually run down to the bottom. And because that, that has more charge now, you can see how it's getting further apart. So they'll spread further out. But if I had a charge that was different, like if this was positive but I had a negative charge and I bring it near it, those tines wouldn't spread apart. They would actually get closer together. And so the electroscope is a historical thing that they used like back in the 1700s. It was the thing that proved that we have two different types of charge long before we knew what charge was. Um, here, this is a FET simulation of um, balloons. So what is happening here is you see that we have a shirt, a wall, and a balloon, and they're all neutral. You see that? They're just as many protons as, uh, as electrons. So if I take this balloon here, and I rub it on the shirt, I can pick up some electrons. And so now the balloon has a negative charge, and the shirt has a positive charge. And they're attracted to each other. If I rub it on there, I can pick up some more electrons, and they're attracted. I think that's pretty straightforward. But if you look here at the wall, this helps demonstrate the polarization that I was talking about. That as I bring this balloon towards the wall, watch the electrons in the wall. What are they doing? Yeah, they're moving away. Now in the end, it's still neutral. I'll see that. But if I get the balloon close enough to the wall, it will stick to it. It's not transferring any charge. Because the number of electrons is still equal to the number of protons, the wall is still neutral. But this thing is charged. But because these electrons moved away, it kind of leaves what we call like a surface charge of positive, which would attract our negative balloon as well. Okay? And so if we have enough charge built upon a balloon, we can get it to stick to the wall. And it, it won't charge the wall. Okay? And if I could get the real life balloon to stick to the wall, the question is always, well, how long will it stay there? Well, it depends on two things. Number one, how much charge you actually put on the balloon. And that Van de Graaff can put quite a bit of charge on it. Um, but the other thing is, is, how long does it stay? Well, it really depends on the moisture in the air. So the more humid it is, remember I mentioned about the fairy tale about how like, oxygen likes to steal electrons? Well, what is water? H2O, plus there's also oxygen. They will steal some of those electrons off the balloon. So the more water vapor, the more stealing occurs. So the, basically, the more water vapor, the less time it actually will stick to the wall in real life. Um, I said that. Okay. Right. So here, you know, this is the definition of static electricity. It's the, the charges are stationary most of the time. Now you'll notice here it gives us a couple of pictures. One is of a kid with his hair standing up, which makes sense, because uh, if it has one charge, it'll all be repelled. But it also shows lightning. Lightning is considered to be static electricity, which is weird because you're like, but that's definitely moving. Well, yes, but most of the time it's just the charge is just built up in the cloud. Okay? And yes, we do notice it's discharging, but most of the time it's not. Of which is why it's considered static electricity. Um, and then this equation here, um, I'm going to have you all look at it, but we're not really going to solve any problems with it. I mean, I'm sure there's some examples of us solving problems with it here. But um, this is called Coulomb's Law, and it's how we can calculate the force between any two given charges. And it's how Coulomb, Charles Coulomb, um, calculated the force. So force is measured in newtons. K is a, what we call electrical constant, which is actually a very large number. K is 9 times 10 to the 9th. I'm sure it's on the next slide here. Yeah. K is 9 times 10 to the 9th. 
And uh, Q1 and Q2 are your two charges in question. And then D is the distance between them. The unit of charge is, um, the unit of charge is the Coulomb, right? And so, <coughs> it's named after Charles Coulomb, who you know, figured out this law. And this is essentially how he figured it out, is he charged up an object and then saw how attracted they were between each other. But again, this stuff happened at the end of the uh, 1700s, beginning of the 1800s. Um, yeah, this is a long time ago. So it turns out, in order for him to make these sort of measurements, he had to have uh, a large amount of charge. And so one coulomb of charge is not one electron. One coulomb of, of charge is actually, well, if we look here, it says the charge on an electron, elementary charge, is 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, which is a very small part of a coulomb, which means if you had one coulomb of charge, you would have roughly 16 not billion, not trillion, not quadrillion, but roughly 16 quintillion electrons. That's a lot. A coulomb of charge is a dangerous amount of charge. To put that in perspective, an average lightning bolt contains three coulombs. Yeah. Well, and so that's the whole thing about this is like his law. You know, the coulomb is this, was you know figured out long before we knew what electrons were, and so he had to have a large amount of charge to measure these actual forces. Um, here's an example that I'm not going to go through, but uh, if you want the answer, it's in the notes section of this. Because like I said, I'm not going to require that y'all do that this year, because we have less time. Um, there's a little thing in here about conductors versus insulators. Um, in general, the uh, whatever is a good conductor of heat Thermodynamics. Whatever is a good conductor of heat will be a good conductor of electricity. Whatever is a poor conductor of heat or an insulator of uh, heat will be a good insulator for electricity as well for the same reason. And the reason is, is because when you're looking at these things, you have um, everything's made out of atoms, but in um, a lot of objects, like you learn in chemistry, like different types of bonds, like your ionic and your covalent bonds, things that bond like that tend to make poor. Uh, conductors, they tend to make insulators. But things like metals tend to make very good conductors. And so there's another type of bond called a metallic bond. And the way metals bond is they don't share, like in a covalent bond, you know, like oxygen might share one of its electrons with another oxygen. Right? Or maybe it shares two of its electrons with the other oxygen. Right? But in a metallic bond, all of the valence electrons are not just shared with another atom, they're shared by every atom in the substance. And so it's not just a covalent bond where you're sharing a couple of your atoms, you're sharing all valence atoms, not just with one or two other atoms, you're sharing them with every other atom in the substance. And so the valence electrons are completely free to move from one atom to another. It doesn't matter, like they don't have any claims. Um, and so that's what makes them good conductors. Um, here, this talks about electric fields, and that's kind of what I mentioned earlier with this little blue disc thing over here, is that the electric field, we say, goes from the positive charge to the negative charge. And again, we're not going to cover too much about electric fields, but electric fields are very useful in helping explain like some of the behavior that's going on. So like today, I'm going to show you guys a couple more demos and literally, some of these demos, you can just put your hand near the charges, and you can feel it. So you can feel the electric field. Um, it's kind of like a gravitational field, except you guys wouldn't know this, but there, you're in a gravitational field right now, but do you feel anything? No, because it's just been there your whole life, right? If it changed, you know, going from here to the moon, you'd notice something that was different. But since this gravitational field is pretty constant, it's hard for me to be like, well, it feels like a field, it's like gravity. But, you know, we don't get out of this situation, so it's hard to say that. Um, so this kind of makes the analogy.
analogy between gravity and electricity. So if you imagine um, the Earth is a big negative charge and you're throwing up a ball, let's say a ball throwing up a, a proton, well, like the proton would go up, but then it would be attracted right back down to the Earth, just like a mass is. And so you can think about that, like, if you throw a ball up from the Earth, it gets attracted back to the center of the Earth. The same thing happens with the electric field. The main difference is between electricity and gravity is that, well, if the Earth was positively charged and your ball was positively charged, if you threw it up, it would just go up forever. Because they were tough. The analogy breaks down a little bit when you talk about the two different charges. Um, <coughs> then we have a, you know, this talks about movement of charge. This really has to do more with the Van de Graaff, which we'll see here in a second. Um, but again, here, this just shows you some fields and how they can be different depending on the charges. And so in general, we say that you have the number of field lines is equal to the strength. So like here for like this one here, you can see like A has roughly two or maybe three times the number of field lines that B does. So like A has more charge. Right? And I'm not gonna go all these crazy things, but it just kind of gives you an idea about what's going on. And so typically the positive um, stay stationary, and we say the, uh, the negative is moving. Right? Um, so here it says that we have a balloon rubbed on a person's head. Both the balloon and uh, the person's head are neutral before they're rubbed together. After you rub them together, then now they're charged. So where does this charge come from? The charge is separated by rubbing, charge is created by rubbing, charge is induced by rubbing, and to the man there's no such thing as charge. Which one? Where's the charge come from? already there were simply separated. Right? So you take like the negatives from your head and put them on the balloon. So this is talking about the Van Graaff. I'm going to give you a brief explanation, but I want to get more detail when I actually turn it on. Um, so the way, so the Van Graaff works basically like this. That you have a belt running up through the center of that column there, and it rubs on a roller down here, and it will build up a charge. Um, typically, the way it works is it actually takes negative charges and deposits them on the felt, and then what's left is positive charge, and so then it's sucking the uh, negative charges off of the uh, dome, leaving positive charge behind. And then it has a grounding rod so that it's connected to the earth, so that it can ground uh, the dome and bring it back to neutral whenever I have it. Um, here, this should be the end of the slides. So here at the end of the slides say, um, again, this is electrostatics. Like this is not current electricity. But electrostatics, the, it is stationary. So you can't plug in anything. You can't plug in a hair dryer or anything. True electrostatics, it will not work. Right? That is current electricity, which is what we're going to start looking at after spring break. And so we say current of uh, Current electricity, there's two types. There's AC and DC, and we'll get into all that. That's just pretty great. All right, so do y'all have any questions here? Okay, so I'm gonna stop recording, and then we'll talk about a couple of demos here. <laughs>